Guys, Prism.fm helps event venues organize with artists and collab on all kinds of show types. Obviously, took a hit during COVID. I thought Matt was going to totally die, and un- he just had unbelievable willpower here, got through it, went to a low of caught 50, 60 grand a month, uh, has now scaled uh, much larger than that, caught over 150, 200 grand a month in revenue, 300 customers today, new customers paying on average 11,000 bucks per year for the platform as he looks to scale, closed a 5 million Series A in 2021, potentially looking at now as well. We'll see what happens. But he says he's very close to profitability. Team of 27 looking to build more payments, potential payments products for the same industry. Hey, folks. My guest today is Matt Ford. He's the CEO of Prism.fm. He's a spiritual seeker living the good life in Austin, Texas. When he's not running Prism or play, he's playing music, hand, hanging with his kids or enjoying nature, Prism uh, helps unfuck the live events industry, which we love. Matt, you ready to take us to the top? Yes. Yes. I didn't write that. Did I about unfucking the live you music? You did industry? write that. Oh, I shit. That is verbatim. <laughs> Don't try and put that on me. Um, but it was, it's, it's been great following your story because you first came on in 2018 when you had just broke 15,000 a month in revenue. And I'm going, oh my God, my guy, Matt, he's going to have a hard time during COVID. There's no live events going on, but you made it through COVID with a ton of momentum. I guess, why don't you touch on that real quick before we get an update? Yeah. Uh, w- yeah. I mean, you're saying touch on COVID. Yeah, we'll just touch on yeah how you made the company sustainable through COVID when revenues, I mean, flatlined or shrunk. Yeah, I mean, we had uh, you know 20, 2018, 2019 was us getting off the ground, and then we had so we had virtually let's call it fourteen months in the market um, before the pandemic hit. And um, I know this is a little uh, against your you know what you typically you know look to see an entrepreneur which is the whole bootstrap methodology but i had raised money at the end of 2019 i don't so mind timing. raising i just don't want i want the <laughs> founders to get rich when they do it you know but yeah you'd raised a million seed in 2017 and a 2.9 million extension in 2019 right yeah and i and i know you're not like totally against uh raising money but like the timing of it was ridiculously good i mean at the end of 2019 we had a couple million dollars in the bank and i i scaled down to a bootstrap team at that moment um, you know, actually, funny enough, I'm I'm full steam ahead profitability these days. So I'm I've, I've come around to really. Wait, are you prof- Were you profitable in June of tw- this year, last month? Uh, we're 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 working towards that. We're not we're not quite there okay. yet, but we're we're using our runway to get to there. And and it's I could we're in a, in a healthy place right now. I'm just being completely honest with you. Like we're, you know, we're uh, I, like I could make some cuts tomorrow to be profitable, but we have we're in a healthy place right now and have some money in the bank. And we're just kind of like coasting to, to profitability at this point now, but it's, we're, it's really right around the corner and it feels good, but you know, we weren't in 2019. So some funding helped us get through that. And it, it really allowed us, it allowed me to keep a team of engineers that were working on the product. And, and we had a, Which were how a many, group. how many engineers at the time? We only had like four people at the time, four engineers working on the product. And I had, I think maybe, you know, three three kind of customer success and sales people that we kept part time uh, to go into the the trenches with our customers. Um, so keeping product development strong during that time and like you know going into the crisis with our customers, it allowed us to. I mean, it really accelerated our impact on the industry. And then on the other side of the pandemic, we've you know five x our revenue since the the bottom of the trough. We also didn't churn a lot during the pandemic, which I think was a major testament to the technology. Like we, we went in with, um, let's call it 120 customers. And we, and we came out with of those 120, we, we came out with, you know, a solid a hundred of them. Like we didn't, we didn't see much churn. Where are you today? Just total customer count. Uh, we're coming up on 300. Yeah, that's great. So it's 60 more than when we did an interview exactly one year ago, which is nice. We'll touch on that here a bit more, but yeah, keep the story going. Cause didn't, didn't you also raise, did you raise a series a in uh, about in 2021 July? Yeah. Yeah, we we raised a Series A in 2021, um, five million dollars, and you know grew grew the business quite a bit. Um, and you sold, I think you told me you sold about 10 percent of the company in that round, right? Like a 50 million valuation, something like that. Um, I can't exactly remember what I what I what I what I told you, but we there was you know there was some decent dilution in that round of funding, um, and um, shoot, I'm sorry, what were you asking me? Well, no, I mean, touch on that, right? I mean, let's say you diluted more than 10% of the Series A. The seed round, you diluted there, you know, maybe 15, 20%. I mean, how do you think about just founder dilutioning and managing your position in the company? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, like I was saying, now, you know, 
let's call it three years. If you take away the pandemic, we've been three years in the market. We have really solid product market fit. We have negative net retention. It and and we have a better understanding. Ne- of ne- like negative, what negative, is. negative churn, right? Negative churn. Negative churn. Yeah, positive net retention. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. With one of our customer segments, it's it's segments. It's uh, it's net retention of one hundred twenty seven percent, and across our whole customer base, it's one hundred and ten percent. So for That's me, impressive. For, yeah, for me, it's like I was grateful to raise when you know it was kind of this pie in the sky, like hey, like fuck it, like we we think there's a big market out there. Like, let's go and find some investors that believe in that as well. And the sky's the limit. But over time, I think we've become more and more rational about how big of a market is. And I'm going to use some like made up numbers here. But, you know, in the start, like, let's say, hey, like, we believe the TAM is 500 million. So it's like, all right, sure, go and raise however much we want. But over time, I think it's really important for an entrepreneur to get more realistic about like what the SAM is versus the TAM and what the true TAM is. And, you know, now that we've had three years in the market, like, it's just quite obvious that this business should be sustainable and profitable as a default. And there's always more things we want to do with innovating. Like we're considering adding payments onto the platform. We're considering, you know, what, what are the customers we can expand into? Um, but if we're, if we're doing that from a place where the core business is profitable, then we're not having to like fundraise to, you know, to avoid a layoff at the same time that we're evaluating these new options. Like we know the default is, Hey, we got a good group of people that love what we're doing. We got a customer base that's like hooked on our product innovation. Like that's the default. Great. So now we can now we can use that, you know, that foundation and look to more and more ways that we can innovate. And for me, I'm like, you know, if if a fundraising opportunity emerges, not out of need, kind of what you were saying, like you're just for the founders getting rich of it. Like we're finally in a place where we can like, we're coming up on fundraising for opportunity versus for need. And I think that's, you know, extremely exciting. Oh, what's going on there, YouTube? Good to see you guys. Now imagine this. You love watching these interviews with SaaS founders, but imagine if we took all of the valuation data out from over 2,807 interviews I've done manually. Saves you a lot of time. Well, we've done this. We've built it into the beautiful interface inside of FounderPath. Check this out. I'll show you how you can access this in a second, but you log in, you connect your Stripe account, you see your valuation real time, you can see what it changed over the past 88 days, and even set goals for valuation this year. Now, the secret valuation is there's many different ways to value a SaaS business. So the reason you're going to see three or four different valuations inside of your FounderPath dashboard, this is all free, by the way, is because depending on who's doing the buying of your SaaS company, you're going to get a different valuation. A VC is going to pay a different valuation. Private equity firm is different. If you're going to do a minority sale, that's different. And if you sell the whole business, that's a different valuation. You can see all those when I hover over here. Right, so the teal is what a VC would pay, yellow is what private equity, and red is if you sold the whole thing outright. Now, what's cool about this is this is not built off random data. Again, you guys hear these interviews on YouTube. All these data are built from real time valuation data points founders share with us on the show. So, traction 1.2 million, seed round 3.7 raise, they sold 22% of their business. Go in here and filter by the event. Maybe you only want to see companies that have sold the whole business. Well, here are a bunch that have been acquired, the valuation and the multiple. Maybe you're going out right now and you're raising your seed round. Well, go in here and look at all this recent seed deals that went down, what they raised, what valuation they raised at, and what percent that they sold. There's never been a larger data set of SaaS valuations than what you can get now inside of FounderPath, and we're thrilled to bring it to you. All right, we're going to go back to the YouTube video here in a second, but if you want to check this tool out, if you want to jump in and sign up, you can check it out for free to get your valuation at this link, this link, founderpath.com forward slash products forward slash valuations, or if you go to founderpath.com and hover over products, click on get your valuation here and go ahead and sign up to give it a whirl. Again, all that valuation data live right inside the platform. I hope to see you there. All right, let's jump back into the interview. You've managed dilution to the extent where you still own a nice chunk of the business. I call it 30 to 50%, right? Something like that. Yeah, I own a nice chunk. And you're back to your question, like, how do I think about it? Like, it would be great to own a greater percentage of Prism, but this is, I'm, this is the furthest I've taken a company. I, I, I own an asset that grows directly with how much I succeed. Um, I'm in complete control of my most valuable asset. It's more than so anything no else. No co-founders. What's that? No co-founders. 
uh, I had co-founders along the way that we've uh, parted ways with, uh, and you know, mostly all in good, good, good grace. Do you have to yeah, spend money? To, you have like, to spend money to part ways. You have to buy them out, or how'd that work? Um, a little bit of it, it depends on the story. Um, a couple we spent money on, yeah. A couple of it was more like cordial, and we and they and they bought their equity. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Very cool. Talk to me about um, how you've grown. You've gone from two hundred and forty. These are event venues buying your technology, correct? Not the artists. Uh, well, we have the, we now have event venues in the artist businesses as well using Prism. Tell me about that. Yeah. So it like the overall pitch of Prism is uh, you know the the live music industry is this like connected ecosystem of uh of people that are doing business uh to make concerts happen you have the venues and the promoters who are putting on the events and then you have talent agencies who represent the artists and they're and they're booking these and they're they're uh essentially like selling the bands to these uh venues and promoters so we work with both sides of the ecosystem and that mostly helps with data transfer long story short like it if a promoter and a venue is both using prism there's a really enhanced kind of efficient show that gets planned. Um, but if, uh, if you know, if they're not using Prism, then they have to do a, an amazing amount of data entry. So we've created this like network effect kind of gravity uh, in using the system where you, if you work with three people who are using Prism, it's this enhanced benefit. And then you go and work with someone who's not using Prism. It's not that you don't want to do business with them, but it's like you, you tangibly notice like, hey, like I'm just more efficient as a business when I work with someone that's using the same network as me. So that's, that's a big part of our strategy. And have you increased pricing or is each customer still paying about 600 bucks a month? We, we have increased pricing quite a bit. Um, I mean, our, our like month, our current month ACV is obviously quite different than if you look at all of our 300 customers, because we have a lot of people that were paying a hundred bucks in the early days, but to date, to date, we're getting an ACV like above 11,000. Okay. Okay. Very cool. And just to, to round out revenue growth. So one year ago, when you came on the show, you were doing about 155,000 a month in revenue across 240 customers. Where are you today? Well, uh, I can't disclose exactly what our revenue amount is at, but we're, you know, growing ACV strong and we're above 300 customers now. So. Okay. Why can't you've always shared when you come on in the past, uh, you said that you were up six X since the recession. You, when you came on during the recession uh, or the COVID, you said you're doing about 56,000 across 120 customers. So can we assume you're six X 50 grand a month? Uh, yeah, you could assume that. <laughs> Sorry. Those are numbers you gave me. I don't want to make a false assumption or the numbers you gave me accurate. Yeah. There's just some strategic things happening right now that I can't like publicly be super clear about the numbers, but you know, growth is heading in the right direction. Are you selling the company? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, yeah. How much are you targeting in the fundraise? <laughs> uh, we're we're looking to raise. You're so funny. We're looking to raise like uh, a little bit of money, basically. Like uh, back to the whole profitability conversation. We're we're in a place where we don't have to. I'm 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 not selling a big chunk of the company. We're like kind of bridging our way to profitability, though. <laughs> well, look, listen, if I read in the news that Prism does a $30 million Series B, in my head, I just want you to know, I'm going to hope that on the backside, you reserve 70, 80% of that as secondary for yourself. Let's just put it that way. No, I appreciate it. I, this is not what this next round is about. Like during, we, we had, this is, you're going to like this. We had opportunities to raise a larger round of funding. And we intentionally were like, hey, like let's dilute less right now. We don't actually need it. Um, and there's a question of, oh, could we turn that to secondary? Like, frankly, like, I don't feel like I'm quite at the place where I'm, I'm doing that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm Is really, that because you're choosing to, I mean, have you asked for it and folks said no, and you, you just feel like you don't have the leverage to get it right now? No, right now I'm more focused on growing the business. Yeah. Like I think like for me, there's a clear, like I'm, I'm conserving the equity that I have and, you know, saving it for the future and, um, you know, there's a clear, like I see a clear runway right now to get the company, you know, to 15, 20 million in recurring revenue. And it's just my own kind of calculations and willingness to hold on. How long that. will it take you to get to 15 run rate? You think the, the, the end of this year or what's going to take the end of next year? Um, end of next year. Yeah. Yeah. That's aggressive. That's, that's the like goal. That. Can the you big, do that with the your big thing in the horizon? Product? That's curious is if we can if we can break into the payment space. That's that's like the new you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's the analysis there? I mean, we have a lot of listeners that have SaaS that are thinking about like, should I add embedded finance? So, like, when you're thinking about should we invest in developers to add a fintech product, and if so, what percent of the GMV can we take? Like, how are you modeling that? How are you thinking about it? 
Well, I think every opportunity is different, but you know, for us, there's a question of like Prism. Prism is, I think we've kind of like earned the right to be involved in the payment because our customers, you know, the, the payment that would be that we would be getting in front of is the uh, the payment of the venue to the band. And, and Prism how much of that do you already sit on? Do you know how much of that you've processed the past year? Well, okay. So the key word is process. How, if we were, if we had the full network utilizing payments, it's over eight hundred million dollars flowing. The past twelve months. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's the projection for this twelve months for twenty twenty three. But what was last? Like, if you look at historical, like five hundred like, million. Okay, yeah. So what your your analysis is, man? If we actually facilitated the payment with investing engineering to do the payment rails and stuff, and you guys kept two percent to five hundred million, that number gets big pretty quick. Yeah, like the, the the long of what I was trying to say is like, do we have the, you know, the right to be the one that, you know, that that does facilitate that payment? And I think what we've done on the SaaS front has given us a what right. What do you mean the right? I don't know what you that. mean by that. Like what, like, can can someone just come in tomorrow and say, hey, we want to invent a technology for uh, like a payment solution for the industry. And what I'm saying is we have a more of a right to do that than someone who comes in tomorrow because we're already helping these people organize their payments and doing a payment ledger and doing the contracting around the payments. Yeah. Well, how are they doing the payments right now? Like, do they put it through bill.com or something? Who are you competing with? Yeah. So they, they, they contract it in Prism. They schedule it in Prism. They track it in Prism, but then they go into their bank account and actually facilitate it. This it. feels like a very natural thing for you to do, right? I mean, that's what I'm saying. That's what I mean by how we earn the right. Yeah. Yeah. So what what take rate do you think if you process eight hundred million in the next twelve months? Do you think you can take a two percent, a five percent, a twenty percent cut? Absolutely not. I'm at twenty percent. I mean the so he, this is this is this is what we've learned is like you have to ask yourself like what what propensity the market has like what are they used to? So for Prism like what are we offering like you know it, 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 in exchange for efficiency and better organization um, like. Okay, you know, but what are they doing instead? Right now they're sending ACH and wires, and that's like anywhere from free or like 20 bucks a month to like $20 a payment. So we wouldn't have the immediate opportunity to take like 5% of a payment to an artist. Like people would be like, all right, no, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save a little efficiency and go into my bank. It's not worth five thousand dollars. What about what about what about two percent? Two percent of five hundred million is ten million dollars in revenue for you. This is this is what I'm getting at. So for us it's like there the question is is like how you know there's a direct revenue stream even if it's not 10% or 5%. And the strategic moat of being the payment facilitator and getting people like in love with that solution of like not having to work with their bank account every single time and having to be more organized and streamlined. That's what's exciting. But yeah, but there is a transactional opportunity as well. The other question yeah. is how much is that 800 million, you know, you know, chopped up? Like if you think of a POS system at a bar, like that's like a bunch of $5 to $10 payments. So for them to take, you know, 5%, it's like, you know, whatever, let's call it a quarter to a dollar. So that's it's a it's really easy for payments companies to take a bigger cut of a smaller transaction. Then a smaller cut of a bigger transaction, depending on the market. So that's yep. something that yep. we're working through right now. But still, there's there's a, there's enough payments for it to be a very exciting opportunity for us. Yep. And what's the team size today? How many full time? We are at twenty. Uh, sorry, I'm like I'm trying to think. Twenty seven. Yeah, twenty seven. And and are you still using sort of an outsourced engineering team, or is that all in house at this point? No, we've never had outsourced engineering. We've always been in house. Oh, okay. How many engineers? We have of that twenty seven, I believe, uh, seventeen. Are you built are all in in Austin, or are they spread out? We're a little bit spread out. Our core team is in Austin, and we have a few people in Detroit, and then we have some international engineers um, that are like full time employees. It's not like a dev shop situation. Very cool. Very cool. Well, yeah. We're rooting for you, man. Congrats, Thank you. Let's wrap up here with the uh, the famous five. Number one, your favorite book. Uh, my favorite book of all time. Let's just go with The Alchemist. That's a good book. Yeah, your last one was the Da Vinci bio. I'm sensing a trend here. All right. Oh, that number was really good. Yeah. yeah. Really that. And number two, is there is there a CEO you're following or studying? Last time you said Grimes, so you got to pick somebody new. I said Grimes. <laughs> I, that's probably just the podcast that I listened to. <laughs> um, I thought I I uh, I'm super happy for Sam Altman and what OpenAI has cracked open. Like I think I'm not as like. I'm not going for the roller coaster ride that everyone is with how, like I think there's an amazing amount of noise in the in the signal of what AI is, but 
open AI has clearly like done something very important and interesting and we'll see where it goes in the future. But if, if it doesn't go anywhere besides what it's already done, it's extremely impressive. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building Prism? My favorite online tool. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of marketing myself and using Camtasia, which is like a, a way to like chop up like like live recordings. Old of the school, man. Camtasia is old school. Wow. Okay. Man. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? I get... I try to get nine. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And still uh, not married, one kid. What, you're 34 now? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm in a in a relationship, not married yet, but that, that could change in the future. <laughs> Any more kids or still? I don't want to divulge anything on the podcast that I can't divulge, but there's <laughs> there's things there's things happening with the company and there's also things happening with my personal life. <laughs> that's very exciting. It's still one kiddo or you have more at this point? Yeah. Uh, uh, just, just one for now, but once again, you know, Very something might exciting. be away. <laughs> you know, you, you don't want to break baby news on the podcast. That's for sure. Uh, we want, uh, family first, family first. All right. And Matt, how old, how old are you? 34? Yeah, you had it right. 34. Yeah. All right. Take us home here. Something you wish you knew. The same age. So yeah. I know it's perfect. <laughs> Take us home. Something you wish you knew when you were 20. Something I knew when I was 20. Um, I think just the importance of, uh, wherewithal and, keep in, in positive attitude and a, a willingness to persevere is, is like the seemingly like to maintain a good attitude and uh, you know, through like challenging times, like to like work that muscle and to understand it more and more. Guys, prism.fm helps event venues organize with artists and collab on all kinds of show types. Obviously took a hit during COVID. I thought Matt was going to totally die. And he just had unbelievable willpower here, got through it, went to a low of caught 50, 60 grand a month, uh, has now scaled uh, much larger than that, caught over 150, 200 grand a month in revenue, 300 customers today, new customers paying on average 11,000 bucks per year for the platform as he looks to scale, closed a 5 million Series A in 2021, potentially looking at now as well. We'll see what happens. But he says he's very close to profitability. Team of 27 looking to build more payments, potential payments products for the same industry. Matt, thanks for taking us to the top. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers. They try and do a deal live, and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com forward slash slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right. I'll be in the comments. See ya.